Good afternoon, good, good morning, everybody, wherever I, wherever I around Australia. My, my name is Darren Sherry, and welcome to the Accountants Connection webinar series, brought to you by business, Your Business First. Um, today's topic is how you can expand your business and provide excellent customer service through outsourcing. A bit of housekeeping before we start is that, and first of all, thank you very much for, for those people who had uh, provided their questions and comments in, in, uh, during the registration. We'll attend to those during the course of the webinar. And also I'd like to um, welcome you um, to, if you've got any questions or comments to make during the course of the webinar, please feel free um, to put in the chat box or we can save those questions and we can have a little discussion towards the end. Um, also the, the wonderful offer that Mark's gonna provide us um, to you today as, as, a, as an appreciation of your attendance. So please stick around for that. Um, but, but before we begin, um, just, a bit about, just a bit about me. My name is Darren Sherry. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm the CEO and Principal Consultant here at uh, Your Business First. And we focus on working with accounting firms um, in the areas of practice management, peer-to-peer um, -peer consulting and virtual CFO services. Um, I've been in the accounting profession uh, most of my career as a, as a general manager, practice manager for those firms and decided to branch out and form Your Business First and to uh, um, help work with um, accounting firms directly. So um, I've, I've written um, five e-books and four of them are currently up on our website as we speak and we formed affiliations with some international firms uh, as part of our peer-to-peer -peer and um, as part of also our digital platform as well. But without any further ado, um, a lot, what I'd like to do is introduce you to, to Mark, who's the CEO um, of, um, of DICOM Smart Stuff. He'll talk to you today about um, outsourcing and the benefits of outsourcing and some, maybe in some of the um, uh, hints and tips that you need to take into account if you want to outsource your accounting work. So thanks very much, Mark. Take it away, buddy. Okay, Gary, uh, Gary, Darren, so, so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I thought I might start with a little bit of a background on myself and how I got uh, firstly into business and secondly, uh, more recently into outsourcing. So I've, I've got a background of a, uh, mechanical engineer initially, and then I uh, branched out into electronics and became a robotics engineer. But in the mid eighties, I decided that I wanted to be in my own business. And I had this, this idea that by the time I was 40 years old, I'd be financially retired. I'd had more money, company car, overseas trips. I'd have more freedom. And I'd be doing the type of things I love to do most importantly. That was kind of the myth. You know, I was in business for a couple of years and then I realized that it wasn't really exactly what I'd set out or what I had in mind. And of course, I talked to lots of business owners and it's a very, very similar story. Within a couple of years, you find that you've actually got less freedom. I was working between 80 and 100 hours a week in my business. I was earning way less money than I had in my corporate position. And the worst thing was I was spending a lot of my time or most of my time doing stuff that I really didn't like doing. I didn't enjoy and I wasn't actually really great at. So it wasn't really, the reality was very much different than this vision that I'd had for my business. And I suspect that a lot of business owners probably would say similar things. But some of the challenges, and I have a heap of challenges as we do in business, but some of the challenges that kind of lead me, lead me into the outsourcing solution was um, this overwhelming amount of back office stuff, the admin type work. It was, just, it was just overwhelming. But also I had a team or I developed the team. I had about 25 technicians in my business. It's a technology business. And getting those techs to do that entry level work was quite a challenge. And so... They'd come on board and after six months, even the junior techs were saying, look, I've got to do, we, I want to do this good stuff, the interesting stuff. And I'm thinking, well, that entry-level stuff still needs to be done. And one of the other challenges I had was just that recruitment and managing of the team. It was just a continual nightmare. And it was also one of the biggest risks in the business. So one of the solutions I came up with was the, the idea of outsourcing those back office tasks and also that entry-level technical work. And what I found was that the benefits, one of, it, one of them was, or the first one, was that it allowed me to focus on the core business. Now that business of mine, I, we've, it's a security, um, CCTV security and wireless communications business. I only work five hours a week in that business. So I've got a local manager, I've got my team in the Philippines and the business more or less runs on its own. I, I, I'm a consultant, in fact. I get involved when we're putting out, uh, responding to tenders or when we're going out to visit some of the clients, but I work five hours a week and it enables me to now then go off and do other things that I, I do, which is writing books and things like that. 
but it also helped me to solve capacity issues. I had staff, but I didn't have enough staff for what I needed. And obviously employing local staff was horrendously expensive. And so I was able to scale up and employ something like five or six staff for the price of a local. So that, that really helped and it enabled us to provide better service. And, and three of our core things we try to achieve in the business are um, speed of response, the quality of communication and quality of service. And by having extra team members, we were able to sort of achieve those metrics for our clients. But over the years, now I started this journey in 2010, and over the years, I've had lots of challenges. And a lot of questions I get asked, I'm going to respond to today. Uh, for example, where do you go to find these staff? Um, how do you manage the challenge of recruiting staff in another country? How do you build and develop rapport and trust with a different culture? And how do you manage the team? How do you integrate offshore staff if you've got local staff? How do you, how do you manage that integration piece? It's really, really important. And of course, a question that comes up a lot is how do you manage the data security and privacy? Um, one question I want to talk a little bit about was setting up a business in the Philippines. In Australia, it's so simple. You, know, you can have it done in, in about an hour. The Philippines is incredibly difficult. I'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, before we go into question time, uh, what are the sort of things that you can outsource and how would you go about doing it? So the first thing was, where would you find good staff? Now, I, I looked at lots of different countries around the world before I started this journey, and I sort of decided on, on the Philippines. And this was in 2010, and Laurie will remember um, that, we were that they were having elections then, and there was lots of violence going on in the Philippines at the time. Now, of course, what I come to learn in retrospect is that the news, news reports focus on the small bits of violence. So it's not like the whole country is like that. But having said that, I decided to go to, to Vietnam. Now, I spent six months in Vietnam, put together a team of about seven staff, technical staff, who were really great technically. But unfortunately, the language skills were not, not so up to scratch. And I had a bit of pushback from my staff and, um, and clients. So in 2011, I ended up in the Philippines. And what I found is that the Filipinos have really great English communication skills. They've got a slight American accent, which is not unpleasant at all. Um, we can get some, we get really good technical people there. Uh, it's also, they also have really great personalities. They've got lovely personalities, very pleasant and a great attitude to work with. They're respectful, proactive, hardworking and trustworthy. So they really tick a lot of the boxes of a person you want on your team. One of the second things is, is recruiting. And I've learned a lot about recruiting in, in another country over the years. The first thing is not to rush. So when you when we put an ad out there, we run the ads, we get about 150 to 200 responses. And what we find is about half of those uh, responding to something that is nothing like the, ad, the job ad we put out. So we, we've got a process where we can shortlist fairly quickly down to about between 40 and 60. Uh, and then we go through another process where we bring that down to about 12. Um, so there's a, and, and they, now that, look, it's relatively easy to get down to that, but it does take a bit of time. What do we do at the last, in the last stage is if, if they're a client facing staff member, um, we'll get them to do, to rec we'll record interviews and I'll actually personally listen uh, to each of those. And I can determine whether the English is good enough within about a one or, one or two minutes. So for me, when we get to that final stage, it takes about 30 minutes of my time. That then narrows the field down to about three. And what we've learned is that we get a local expert. Uh, a good example of that is in the financial services area, our accountants. I always get my local accountant to interview the final three. Uh, and that's how we choose really good staff. And so whether that be technical, marketing, web development, or whatever, we have a local expert to, to actually do that final interview piece. And that's, that was uh, very powerful for us. The third thing is developing rapport and trust. Now, this is really, really, really important, particularly with Asian cultures like the Philippines. Um, they're very respectful. And that sounds like a great thing, which it is, but there's a downside to it. And the downside is if they don't understand something or they don't agree with you, they won't say anything. And in the worst case, they'll just disappear. We've had that happen to us and we're just they're scratching our head wondering what's going on. And so what we suggest is that when you start working with somebody in one of these cultures, is you start off with really simple tasks first and get some wins on the board and start to develop the relationship and the trust both ways. And that seems to work really well. The other thing is explaining your own corporate culture. 
uh, we in Australia have a very different culture to the, to the Philippines. They've got a very hierarchical structure over there. And it's really like, you know, one of my things, the very first thing I see is don't, don't call me sir. You know, my name is Mark because they, they call everybody sir over there. And, you know, a, a leader um, gets the respect just because they've got the title leader or manager. It doesn't matter whether they're a good leader or not. That's just the way it is. And so we, we, we find it useful to explain that. And the other thing is I have a policy. I've always had a policy in my 40 odd years of management. I don't chastise people for mistakes. Um, we, 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 look, we recognize mistakes and we work through them together. Um, you know, I have, I have staff come to me and say, well, crack, you've made a terrible stuff up. You know, and that's, I don't want to find out about it from the client. I want to find out, out about it then and there so we can actually deal with it properly. And that, that works really well. And it also helps with that, developing that rapport and trust between the two of you. That's the same, by the way, for, I believe, for local staff or offshore staff, it doesn't really matter. Managing staff is a, is a challenge. Um, and what I found the best way to solve that is, is having a PA you know, who understands all the different um, skill sets we've got within the organisation. If you've got a task, you say, OK, you can get this done. My PA will just engage with the different um, staff members to do that. Of course, I engage personally with somebody who's working on a project. But that's something that um, has worked really well for me. Uh, the other thing is that there is a whole heap of stuff that I was doing that I just didn't enjoy. Um, I just delegated that, outsourced it. And now when I look back on some of those things, I just um, shake my head off and block it. There's just no way I want to go back to doing that. So I'm sure most of us have these things that we don't really like doing. Once you get let go of them, you wonder why, we, why you ever did them in the first place. And the third thing is learning to let go and delegate. Now as business owners, one of the challenges quite often we find is that we don't want to let other people do the stuff that we do because we can do it better. Um, and again, at the end of the day, if that's you in the business, you've just got a job, you don't have a business really. So it's really important to be able to let stuff go and, and delegate. One of the other things that's really, really important is how do you integrate your local team with offshore staff? Because obviously if you're going to employ somebody offshore that's going to cost you a fraction of what it costs to local, local's going to be thinking, oh, I'm worried about my job, you know, I'm going to lose my job type of thing. Now I've got a policy that I would never put somebody off because I'm, I've got somebody coming on my off, offshore. And so what I do is make sure that my local team have got plenty of work and they're, they're working on sort of core business type activities that so they're engaging with clients, they're doing strategic type things, high level type tasks that can only be done here. And, and sometimes you'll have to actually um, increase their skills to give extra training, but obviously they're gonna bring additional benefits into your business. So it's really a matter of focusing on the things that are gonna get you the, re the best result in return. Another thing with the um, with the local staff is um, getting them to give our offshore team the stuff that they, they don't like doing because within that team we'll have somebody who likes doing some of those tasks. And I found particularly with my technical team, they were just delighted to get rid of this stuff and they, they ended up integrating and working very well together. Again, I sort of keep on coming back to the, the term staff. I mean, I, I treat our, our, our offshore team as local staff. And so that means bringing them into local meetings and things like that. We've got a number of clients who employ our team in the Philippines and they do the same thing. When they have staff meetings and team meetings, everybody's together. And that seems to work quite well as well. Comments on data security and privacy. We get lots of questions around that, of course, particularly uh, in the financial services area. Uh, there's two, as two ways we look at this. The first way is your team. And, and you know, you, we, we, I've got absolute trust in my team. They manage all of my finances. They've got access to all the bank accounts. And part of that is, is the rigorous selection process. But the other aspect of it is I find the culture and the people in the Philippines are very, very trustworthy. I've never had an issue. Um, another aspect of the team is, is your culture. Uh, if you've got a, a culture of trust and, uh, and, and good rapport, that then comes through to the team. I mean, I know even businesses locally who have got, they're suspicious of everybody. And of course they attract that into their, into their organization and their lives. Um, we do, we recommend reference checks and also um, in the Philippines they've got this thing called the National Bureau of Investigation, which are like the federal police clearance and so we ask our staff to get that. It's very well, it's very difficult to get and it's very well regarded. Of course in the online world, uh, one of our sister companies is a um, systems integrator, so they take care of all of the, um, the cyber security and things like the virtual private networks, firewalls, that sort of thing. 
we run a multi-factor authentication and we've got a password, um, centrally managed password management system, so none of our staff need to know. I don't know any of my own passwords, they're all managed remotely. And at the top level, we can provide locked thin client terminals, which is basically a box that sits on their desk. Uh, it's got no access to any ports, you can't copy, paste or download anything. So all the information data remains in Australia. So there's, there's various levels of data security and privacy we can apply. Uh, obviously, in this day and age of COVID, a lot of Australian companies are having people working remotely. So we, we've had the same data security and privacy issues, whether the person's working in Mornington or in Manila. So setting up an offshore business, easy, right? Just pay a thousand bucks and you've got a business. Think of a name. In the Philippines, it's not like that. We have to have, um, Laurie, can you correct me? Is it six or seven uh, directors and shareholders that are local Filipinos? At least six, Mark. So, yeah. <laughs> so imagine that you've got to have six local people who are on the board and who are shareholders in the business. It took us uh, nearly two years to get our business registered. And uh, and obviously one of the things to keep that was having local experienced people who were working, we were working with. And we just got to allow the time because it is a, a time consuming process. I think having been done it once, the next time we do it, it's be, be much quicker, but it is uh, it's a process. So some other questions before I hand over to Laurie. Um, one of the questions obviously I get asked a lot is shouldn't we keep jobs in Australia? And the answer to that is absolutely and yes, of course we should. Particularly right now, um, in, within the COVID situation, it's even more important. But the fact is that importing goods and services is a reality. I mean, I was in the in the manufacturing game in the in 1980s, and I remember the government said to me when I, I was developing some products at that time that I need to learn to become competitive on the global marketplace. And, and I was a little bit annoyed not getting the support from the government, but it's actually true. It's like when you run a business, you identify your strength, your core strengths, and you work out, work with other people to, to supplement what you're not great at. And services is the same thing. And the idea is that um, if we if we can actually run our businesses so that we can increase the competitive efficiency, competitive edge and profitability, of course we're going to grow and, and employ more local staff. Another question we get is what happens if staff leave? Now, of course, that's the reality of life. It doesn't matter where in the world you are, staff leave and probably quite often at the most inconvenient times. So first thing to answer the question there is really is about your own culture. You know, you want to have a culture where the staff are excited, they're exported, um, they're looked after, they're supported, and they're excited to come and work in your business and be part of that business and part of the vision and the growth of the organisation. That's the first step. And the other thing we do is all of our team document what they do. Uh, so they create training materials, they create processes and documentation. That becomes the IP of our clients, but also it helps us train other staff. We always recommend having a second staff member involved uh, as a backup for anything that we do. And that so has worked really well for us. So what I'd like to do now is what if, uh, just a few frequently asked questions. I'll just hand over to Laurie so she can answer these questions specifically related to the financial services or accounting area. So, Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Laurie. I'm a senior accountant in Icon Smart Staff. Um, our staff have experience dealing with um, different accounting packages having prior experience even working bef uh, before working for Dark and Smart staff. For example, I have you know, experience using Myob Essentials, QuickBooks, um, Xero, as well as Wave Accounting. Um, and all our, our team is familiar with working with double entry accounting systems. That is the underlying basis of you know, these accounting systems. But of course, we are also aware that some businesses utilize a single entry system, aka the spreadsheet method, which is very convenient and simple for them. Um, and then we can also, in terms of you know, what we can assist you with, we can help you um, with your BAS or PayYG reporting. So we can review financial transactions for a specific period that coincides with the, the BAS period to ensure that the sales and expenses are properly attached with GST or no GST. And then we can also prepare tax calculation or tax reconciliation of GST due or refundable amounts. And, and then we can also fill in you know, the BAS for you with the relevant information for you or your clients. 
Similarly, um, we can also assist you with your super by, cal by calculating and processing its payments for you or your clients. Um, or we can customize you know, our services to your needs. Um, we can help you on your existing tasks. For example, as I've mentioned, we can perform a transaction review to assist in calculating the um, correct GST payable or um, assist in processing superannuation as well as pay YG. So once we have understood your current processes, what we normally do is we document your process and create a material for you, which Mark said is your IP. Um, so if we allocate that to, um, to a lower level staff, um, we can, you can use that um, document to train our staff who will eventually be working with you. Eventually, once we have grasped and understood your existing process, we can take a look at you know, optimizing as well as streamlining them. Um, on the flip side, we can also customize financial reports for your business to help you get a more holistic view um, by taking you know, your raw data from your accounting software and making a meaningful report from it, such as, for example, you know, a profit report um, that can help you track your business businesses business profitability or a cash flow report to help you manage your cash flow and receivable collections. Um, it's entirely up to you. So if you think you need any assistance in any way, I'm sure we can help you out. Thanks, Lauren. Right. And that uh, brings us to some questions. Well, thanks very much, Mark and uh, Laurie, for presenting that. I suppose from, from my end, um, I've known I've known Mark for a couple of years now, with and um, I got to know him, you know, both professionally and and, and personally through um, his business operations and through our through our networks. And one thing I can say is that he he does take that um, uh, strict approach when it comes to particularly point six when we're talking about the privacy and security of um, of um, everyone's data very very seriously. And that was basically one of his uniquenesses, I believe, in relation to setting up the um, um, his operations in the Philippines. So thanks again, Mark and uh, Laurie, for presenting that. One of the questions that did come through on the, a few questions that did come through on the registration is that, um, how do you propose to control the publication of the client's tax file numbers, um, considering not only the ITR uh, in income tax returns, but also um, different do ATO documents uh, for the clients as well. So we, I might um, call on Murray, but just before I do that, one of, one of the things to remember is that um, this, uh, having somebody in, in Manila or having somebody in Mornington is basically no difference if they're working remotely. So whatever, whatever you would do with your local staff, uh, you would do the same thing with, uh, with staff in the Philippines. So that's, that's the first part. You, obviously, uh, whoever's got that question or that, that issue would have processes already um, documented around that for their remote staff. Yeah. Laurie, did you want to make a comment on that? Uh, yeah, sure. sure. Um, so actually for one of my clients, Mark, what we are, we're actually doing is blotting out, blotting out the TFN or putting in TFN provided in place of the number before we actually provide it to other people who may use the document. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but when you say other people who use the documents, are other team members, is it? Yes, okay. correct. Or, yeah, yeah or outside um, DICOM Smart Staff as well. Yeah. So, Such so as the bank, yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is a good time to um, pose some questions um, for those on, on the line. So, if you've got any questions, please unmute yourself and, and ask the questions. I'm sure uh, Mark and or Laurie will be able to answer them for you. But there's another question I've got as well with respect to the um, uh, the accounting software. I suppose from um, from my experiences, um, one, of, one I suppose one of the challenges that accounting firms do have if they want to if they're looking at outsourcing um, um, uh, their, their work to um, to people like yourselves is that is the time is the time to recruit and to train etc. So. What's, what's been your experience and how do you go about um, helping that accounting firm, um, I suppose, relax their, their issues and concerns? So the, I guess the first answer to that question is, and I mentioned it in one of the slides, is this is not a quick process. 
Um, what we would do first is get that particular accountant or whoever it is to provide a, a job description, exactly the same as if they're advertising a job here in Australia. And then we go through our process. So we've got internal staff who can actually, who've got capacity to do certain things. But then we go through the process I described before where we run an ad if we're looking, if it's somebody, because bear in mind our organisation, we provide services that could be anything from an hour a week to full time. Uh, if it's a small amount of time, we can do it internally. If it's a large amount of time, like full time, then obviously we go through that recruitment process, which does take time to get to that final person who, who fits the bill. And again, I think it's the same as pretty much any recruiting process anywhere. Um, if there are people who are available right then and there who fit the bill, it's still an, an amount of time to go through the due diligence to make sure you get the right person. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, I believe Peter's got a question. Peter, did you want to unmute yourself and ask Mark, Mark or Laurie a question? Yeah, Mark, just um, one. We outsource, obviously, um, a lot of our services um, uh, through to India and the States. Um, the, the biggest challenge I seem to find, though, and I'd be curious as to how you address this, is how do you actually ensure your staff um, that you've outsourced to are remaining efficient and actually working in your best interest as opposed to they're just wasting time and taking a dollar? And that occurs the same as obviously remote staff within Australia for people working from home. Um, the difference between that and obviously having staff on your premise that you manage is that you are actively managing staff. It, it works a lot different for remote. Yeah, sure. Um, there's a couple of answers to that question. I, I personally have got a, a different view of management, perhaps, because I don't manage my staff <clears throat> as such. I never have. Um, I, they manage themselves. Uh, I treat my staff as, as um, people who are able to manage themselves. I support them. So our management team actually supports our staff. So there's, the first answer to the question is a cultural thing. And, and secondly, um, when we talk about offshore, I treat them as the same way as I treat my local teams. So they are actually part, and Laurie might even comment on this from her own experience, but they're, they're really part of the organisation. Um, we also are very careful in our selection process. As I said, it is quite a time consuming thing to make sure we get the right people on. So we have had um, occasions, of course, over the last 10 years where staff have not been a great fit. So we've found some of that sort of stuff going on. But in addition to that, they record everything they do. So everything is a ticket. So, you know, as a, when you're employing somebody local, you're, you're employing for them to be, um, to be non-active probably 30% of the time. In other words, uh, you know, they're, they're talking to somebody on the water cooler, they're on Facebook, they're having long lunch breaks or whatever it happens to be. Yep. Peter, I think you probably know from the IT perspective, if you can get 65, 70% billable out of, a, out of a, an IT staff, that's recorded billable work. You're doing it brilliant. <laughs> exactly right. Um, and so with our staff, pretty much everything is billable because it's all recorded. And so we don't charge for that time on Facebook or that time chatting with friends. Yeah, my, 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 my concern was more around actually yeah, controlling, um, I mean, maybe it was actually uh, um, requested differently. I, I've actually had situations, and this is what I, I continually struggle with, because I actually get requests for um, internships and for outsource companies all the time. And the challenge I've always had is that obviously being in cybersecurity, and um, it is a very um, regulated area that we actually have to deal with we're dealing very much with uh, clients' personal data um, and securing it, is I've had junior outsourced junior engineers that decide that they either have, think they've got more knowledge than they have or they go outside the bounds of their authority and make changes. And I've been in a hell of a lot of problems previously of trying to clean up the mess of people just clicking, whereas if it's somebody more local, and I've had the same problem local, but it's faster for me to get on top of it because it's present, it's close. What are you doing over there? No, you don't do that. It's very difficult from a remote perspective, I've found, to do that. And I, I, it's kind of one area that's actually limited me from releasing a lot of stuff um, uh, to outsource. I, I think it's a great initiative, but it's this challenge I have is how do I make sure that I don't get people, and maybe it, as you said, it's uh, the selection process, that don't go outside of their authority or boundaries or just become that rogue agent. And in cybersecurity, you cannot have a rogue agent. It mm -hmm. can cause your whole business to literally be decimated. Exactly right. And look, 
I guess the answer to that question is, uh, well, I've had that issue both offshore and onshore. In fact, one of the first, um, one of the worst ones I had was a guy that was came through a headhunter, cost me a small fortune to get the headhunter to find this guy. And uh, when he finally did leave or we parted company, um, I discovered all this stuff. And so that's an issue both locally and offshore. Oh, I agree. And, I've got and, and, it's an offshore yeah. issue. Yeah, and, and look, we've had it. We've had it with our team. team not uh, in fact, probably the only only um, we've had a little bit of in the financial services area. We've had a couple of um, people who were a wrong choice. They didn't do anything that was rogue. They just were not as good as what their resume said. So they didn't kind of stack up in terms of what they said. I interestingly enough, I find females underrate themselves or undersell themselves. Males oversell themselves, and uh, that's that's one of the things. So we've had that problem. We've managed to, um, to resolve it fairly effectively. Uh, we've had the problem in the IT area. Again, that's been a, a major challenge. And it comes down to number one is the, the first the selection process, but number two, being really diligent in that first six months of keeping a very close eye on what's going on. Yeah. So, and, I suppose, yeah, so I suppose what you're saying is that you know, we have to have that mentality that just because you're outsourcing um, um, or um, onshoring as well. There's still a member. Uh, there's still a member of your team, and and as yes. such, um, they, they still have to re report to you and keep. And obviously, um, you keep them accountable, just as would as you uh, as a normal employee uh, working inside physically yeah. in your office, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And look, you know, in terms in terms of my current current staff, do you then have actually um, within your I'm, I'm guessing you actually have a large office actually in Manila with all of your people that uh, work with you. Do you actually have support staff for those people as in HR actually um, and uh, site managers and um, uh, duty managers that actually look after the staff to make sure that they are sitting at their desk, they're working and they're not just kind of chewing the fat? So, so a couple of, couple of answers to that question. We don't, at this stage, we don't have an office where staff work from home. Right, okay. Uh, and that's the first thing. The second thing is I've got a very fortunate personality that I, I trust everybody. <laughs> and what I, what I find out that is that 99% of time people are trustworthy. Very, very rarely do we get an issue. Um, but we also have a team that supports. I mean, we've got um, staff in uh, admin, finance, sales, marketing, web development, and IT. So we've got staff across the board. Yep. Um, and our management and HR team are, are, are very effective, I think, at just keeping an eye on that thing and that sort of thing. But again, I um, have never and I never will. I mean, we, we can actually get software that looks at looks at our staff screen, you know, it does snapshots. Yeah, I tried it. that. It doesn't work very well. Well, yeah. I'm not interested. The thing is, I'm not interested in that. You know, I never will do that because I prefer to, to, to work on trust. And again, I might get Laurie to just comment on her experience. But the bottom line is, I find that I trust everybody and 99.5% of the time, the trust is returned. Laurie, yeah, did you want to appreciate that, but from an IT perspective, we actually have to work on a zero trust perspective. Because yeah. that one percent can literally destroy your business. Have somebody actually go rogue, create actually a data breach, and we have to work on zero trust for everything yeah. that we do. So what I can say, and again, I've been running an IT business for for thirty odd years, and uh, in in my experience so far, that I've had more trust issues with local than I have with offshore. But um, and that's again, yeah, that's, that's a cultural nice. that, that's a cultural thing. Yeah, I think you're right there. Yeah, Laurie, <laughs> did you want to did you want to make a comment about your experience? So, Sure. Sure. So I've, 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 I was hired to work as a senior accountant in Daikin Smart Staff since 2018. And what I really like about, you know, the process in the system in Daikin Smart Staff is, is that we work on budgets. Um, so, you know, we, we're not being micromanaged in a sense, because um, as long as, you know, we stick to the budget, we complete the work and then report back you know, you know, that's essentially what, you know, a, um, an employee or a worker, you know, would dream of, um, and not being, you know, bombarded with, you know, <laughs> a lot of questions from the manager and all that stuff, because that creates a lot of, um, from my point of view, sort of, you know, distrust, um, as well as, you know, not being confident that, you know, you've hired us to do this work. Um, therefore, you know, you should be able to trust us to complete it and finish it with quality. So, and, and you know, with that and smart staff, I did not have that issue at all. So, and it, 
you know, with with that comes a uh, with that actually, mm-hmm. you know, it it helps me actually grow into my own profession profession. Um, and it helps me really, you know, become more confident in my work as well. So yeah. Fantastic. So and just Peter, just to add to that, I think I can confidently say that if you are if you were acquiring zero mistakes and everything to be absolutely perfect, I'd fairly confidently say that we probably couldn't work together. Because <laughs> I, you know, I couldn't I couldn't guarantee that. Absolutely not. It's just the way we're dealing with people after all. I mean, I, I make mistakes. I probably more, make more mistakes and stuff ups than anybody in the, in the business. So You're right. If we're actually making zero mistakes, I wouldn't be having this conversation of actually considering outsourcing either. So <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we do we do have mistakes. I mean, look, even, even uh, actually I'm, I'm not infallible. I've actually had situations, but it's a case of um, having – uh, a process which you can capture the mistakes quickly and reverse them back and actually have procedures in place. Um, as I said, but it's only been a case of concern, I suppose, within the cyberspace of uh, that trust level, I suppose. And it's yeah. it's either, um, and look, I agree with Laurie, it's a case of I'm not a fan of these watch your apps. So it's what I've been told that a lot of MSPs are doing. And I go, look, the trouble is though, that's more invasive on my time okay. watching them than it is actually on finding out that they're actually doing something in the first place, you know? So I've, I've always actually been challenged by those ones anyway to say, look, they, it's like actually um, people putting security cameras in and going, that's going to stop the criminals. I go, no, security cameras are only a forensic thing. It'll tell you after the event what's happened when you decide to look at it, you know? So, so Peter, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of a, a real live example of a, uh, where it's actually, I've had examples offshore and onshore. This particular one was one of my, my engineering staff, my IT staff, uh, he came to me one day and said, Mark, he said, I've made a terrible stuff up. I've been working on this lawyer's database. This lawyer had a business in town. He had not have any staff. He actually managed to lose the entire thing. You know, like, like it's just something that never happens, but he did it. And he came to me and said, look, you know, I'm really sorry that I've made this stuff up. And I said, great, let's, let's now work out how we, how we can resolve it. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's, for me, to yeah. me, it's much better to have that level of trust rather than the guy disappears or leaves and all of a sudden you find out you've got this incredible mess. And very reactive as well, yeah, exactly. But that's not a level of trust that you actually had it in because he could have decided just to actually pack up and leave. It's actually the quality of the person that you've had. Absolutely. But I don't think trust comes into it because you're trusting that he's not going to jump ship, but you don't know that. I think what you've, you've, you've actually elaborated on is your selection criteria before they can really do that type of damage has actually gone through quite a rigorous um, event as well. Yeah, the, That's the, why the, you have that trust? Would that uh, be more right? Absolutely, absolutely. But the trust also comes from the confidence that they can come to me and say, look, I've made a mistake. Yeah. You know, rather than think, if, oh, if, I, if I go and say, he's going to do this, that or the other or jump through hoops or whatever. You know, so. yep. no, good point. Thanks. Yeah, great. Uh, um, again, guys, if you've got any other questions, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask. But there was another, there's another question that came through in the registration process, Mark, is that, um, so from a professional services firm, how, how do I come in and, and engage you? Um, so what, what's, what's your criteria in the, um, the way you engage me as, as say, as an accounting firm? The, probably then... Um, the, the best way to answer that is that uh, people don't know us from a bar of soap. And so we've got a, um, an offer, which we're obviously going to make later in this thing, but it's 10 hours for $100. And within that uh, 10 hours, you can pick a whole whole bunch of different things. So we, we tend to say, look, pick something that's a pain in the backside for you. And let's, let's go about doing that. And we, we, we can work. So t- in 10 hours, you get a bit of an idea of how we operate and how we work. And obviously then you just, from that point, you can just go, go forward, either go forward or not. Okay. Maybe maybe we could talk about um, uh, uh, the next next stage then. So if you want to um, yep. um, unshare your screen, I'll bring up. If you want to unshare your screen, and I'll bring up the. Um, so let me just uh, do that. Right. Correct. So I'll just bring it up. Right. So today, um, so can everyone see that? Yep. Yep. Right. So today, um, I'll, I'll get Mark to talk to uh, to you about um, the, the offer that's been per, made available. What I'll do is that um, I'll do that, and then um, and what I'll do, I'll also throw, um, put in the link uh, 
um, I'll copy this into into the chat box as well as part of the um, as part of the offer. So, Mark, do you want to just do you want to just talk to everybody about um, what your offer is today? Yeah. So this this really came about from the you know, the point of view of a lot of people say, look, I want to outsource, but I don't know what, what I don't know what to outsource. I don't know how it works. And that sort of thing. So we thought, okay, look, here, here's something that's in your 10 hours at a, at a very, very much reduced price of $100. And that gives you an opportunity to, um, to try different things. And on the back, back page of that particular thing, it's got a whole bunch of example tasks that you can say, oh, yeah, look, I'll get that one done, like a bass, for example, or whatever it happens to be. And so you'll just get to engage with the appropriate staff, whether it be in web development or financial services or whatever it happens to be. You can just engage for that 10 hours. Fantastic. So if, you, if you're keen to take up this offer, um, just, just put in the chat box, uh, yes. And what I'll do is that either myself or Mark will, um, um, will contact you. So we can talk, talk about it further. Um, for those who are not aware, I've, I've put the link down to this particular um, offer in the, in the chat. So if you want to um, click on the link and provide and get the op and um, download the document, um, please feel free to do so. I'll stop sharing now. So yeah, and um, but yeah, if there's if there's any other um, questions before we finish up, um, you can ask Mark or Mark or Laurie. Yeah. Oh well, great. I've done a good job. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much again for um, um, attending, um, everybody. Much we appreciate your the, the time that you've taken to come out, particularly um, approaching uh, towards Christmas. I'm sure that everybody has got some deadlines they have to meet before uh, Christmas as well. So thank you very much for attending. There will be a recording made of this particular um, webinar and, and we'll, which we've made available on, on our YouTube channel. But you will, um, I'll send you some more information about that. So again, Mark and uh, Laurie, thank you so much for your um, your time today. Is there any um, words that you want to um, provide before, you, before we finish up? No, I'd just like to thank you, Darren, for putting this together and thank everybody for... Um, for giving us their time obviously it's a uh, it is getting close to christmas everything's really busy so i appreciate the uh, the time thank you no problems all okay everybody thank you very much for your attendance today um i wish if i don't speak to you before between now and christmas i wish you everybody a merry christmas and hopefully a better 2021 so please take care um all the best and we'll speak to you soon take care everyone bye-bye thank you